Our scripture text tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, going down through chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 2, verse 5. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord." And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. For those of you who are visitors, we've been on Sunday night preaching a series of sermons for several months on the Protestant Reformation, on the great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us. And this will be the third Sunday that we've considered the great uh, Oliver Cromwell. Very few people understood this passage of Scripture as clearly as Cromwell did. And as a result of his understanding of this passage of Scripture and his efforts... To put it into practice, he was greatly criticized and opposed in his day and has been slandered and maligned ever since. I think probably as much as John Calvin has been maligned and slandered and John Knox through the years, the slander brought against those two men is nothing compared to the slander brought against Oliver Cromwell. And uh, we spent the first Sunday night looking at his godliness to show that this was an extraordinarily godly man. We began looking last week at the first part of his life. We're going to continue this evening. But I want to bring out three points from this text that Cromwell understood that even Christians in our day don't understand. But we've got to get the gist of it. We've got to understand it and practice it if we're going to experience the conquests that this passage speaks of. It says that God's going to overturn human wisdom. That he's going to discredit and overturn humanism. All attempts to understand God without his word, that is, according to the wisdom of this world, God is going to bring to confusion, to naught, to overturn, and the wisdom of God is going to win the victory over the wisdom of men. Now, there's three things in this passage that God says, here's how I'm going to do it. And in each instance... It is a method, it is a tactic that God has chosen that makes him deliberately look like a fool in the eyes of his enemies. Because if you can get your enemy to think you're a fool, you got him if you're not a fool. Because he's going to treat you like a fool, he's not going to be threatened by you, and you can wipe him off the face of the earth if he thinks you're a fool. So there's three things that God's going to do in order to bring the wisdom of this world to naught, and in each three instances, it's, it's deliberately to make himself look like a fool in the eyes of his enemies that he might be in a position to destroy them. First of all, he looks foolish in the message that he has chosen to use to destroy the wisdom of this world. 
It is the message of Jesus Christ and of his crucifixion and resurrection. That has always been an offense to Jews and Greeks, to people who've looked for signs, to people who've sought after philosophy. They've always considered it to be offensive to say that to get anywhere with God, you've got to understand a man that lived 2,000 years ago in Galilee and what his bloody death on the cross meant. And without that man and the bloody cross, there's absolutely no possibility of understanding life or being reconciled with God. And there is an offense to that message, the offense of the cross. It's the power of God unto us who believe, but it's foolishness. To those who disbelieve. And God chose this message on purpose that he's going to use the, uh, to overturn the wisdom of this world so as to make his enemies think he is a fool. Second, the people God has chosen to overturn the high and the mighty. I mean, if the average man uh, set out to handpick a group of men and women with whom he was going to conquer the world, he wouldn't have chosen us. I mean, you and I are like the last people that are chosen on the dividing up teams for a volleyball game. <laughs> the, the lowly, the base, those who are viewed as insignificant and irrelevant in the eyes of the high and the mighty. Not many mighty. Praise the Lord for those in the church that are mighty. Praise the Lord for those in the Christian church that are high. Praise the Lord for those in the church that are noble. But there's few. There's always been few. There's few now. And the instrument that God's going to use to bring down the high and the mighty is not the high and the mighty. It's the little ordinary everyday Christians that nobody will ever read about in history books. Those are the men and women that God's going to use to bring down the tyrants and to bring down the wise of this world. Oliver Cromwell knew that. And then thirdly, the means by which God's going to get his message across that will destroy the wisdom of this world. Preaching by men, by frail, puny, feeble, sinful men. He, that's in the second chapter. He could have sent angels. But instead, he's chosen man in all of his weakness to be the instruments, the vessels of clay holding this great treasure through whose mouths he will present his message that will bring down the high and the mighty. Oliver Cromwell is a great lover of preachers, a great lover of preaching. He was a great lover of the common man, and he was a great lover of the message of sovereign grace and of the cross of Christ that we find here in the Scriptures. Now let's go back and begin looking at this man. By the way, he's always relevant. It always amazes me. In every age, somebody somewhere continues to write something about Oliver Cromwell to this day. And uh, I just picked up my mail, went down to my office today to run some things off, and just glanced right through it and picked up a magazine. Here's a little magazine called The Christian Statesman, and whose picture should be on the front of it but Oliver Cromwell. So we're not talking about somebody that's irrelevant to our day today. We're talking about somebody who's very relevant to where we are and whose viewpoint and efforts have had an immense effect upon the shaping of this country and upon this culture and upon the mentality of people in this land most particularly. Now, where do we leave Oliver Cromwell last time? Charles, King Charles I, the tyrant, oppressor of the church, had raised an army that he was going to use against his own people to establish and extend his tyranny over both church and state. Parliament was representative of Protestant Re Reformation. It was predominantly Puritan, predominantly Presbyterian. Oliver Cromwell was the commander of Parliament's forces that they had to raise in order to defend themselves against the, the bloodthirstiness and tyranny of King Charles. It was this Parliament that had arrested the Earl of Strafford as a public enemy and beheaded him and arrested Archbishop uh, uh, Laud for murderous activities toward the people of England and beheaded him. And remember that the, uh, Cromwell has, had created a new army, the new model army. The previous army was ineffective or the bulk of the parliamentary forces was ineffective because they gave commanding officer positions to nobles because of wealth and arist uh, aristocratic position. And the soldiers themselves were unfit and untrained. 
Cromwell trained a powerful army called the New Model Army. He only uh, had Christians in it, people who feared God. It was the godliest army ever to, to uh, walk the face of this earth, and it never lost a battle. While he was trying to bring order into this chaotic situation through Parliament, because now Parliament had become the powerful instrument of government, representative of the people in England, there were two factions that he had to deal with all the time, the Royalists and the Levelers. You remember the Royalists were those people who wanted to get the king back on the throne. How in the world can there be an England without a monarch? And so they, they were always supportive of the king against Parliament. And there was that large number of people throughout Great Britain. Then there were the Levelers. And the Levelers were one of those sects, S-E-C-T-S, one of those sects that, uh, of which there were many that disrupted things and, and eventually led to the dismantling of the great Cromwellian Republic of those days. The Levelers were men who, many of them were Christians, but they were radical Democrats. That is, they believed that every man other than slaves should have the right to vote. So you see, we live in a leveler republic today. Most Americans are levelers. Uh, and uh, the levelers, by the way, were also anarchists and revolutionaries. They were willing to side with anybody to overthrow, after a while, to overthrow Cromwell. Cromwell had to imprison many of them because, at times because they would uh, try to lead mutinies in the army and overthrow the government and were a threat to social order. Cromwell was an aristocratic Democrat in the biblical sense of the word. That is, he didn't believe that every man should have the right to vote. He believed that you had to be godly and prove yourselves responsible and mature, in, uh, a man, a head of a household, in order to have the right to vote. And so the levelers posed a great problem to him throughout all his life. Then he had to deal with the Scots. Now, the Scots were Presbyterian. The Scots were Reformed by and large. But remember that Charles I was also a Scot. The Stuarts reigned in Scotland before they reigned in England. And so Charles I went back to Scotland and negotiated with the Scots to provide him with an army so that he can regain his authority from the Parliament in England. He said, if you give me the forces to fight with, the Scottish Presbyterians, then I will accept Presbyterianism as the official doctrine and government and liturgy of the church for three years, and I will suppress all these sects like the independence of which Cromwell was one. You see, he was a Calvinist in everything except church government. He didn't believe the church congregation should be organized into presbyteries connected together by organization, but that each congregation was autonomous and separate by itself. And so the king says, you get me back in power and we'll squelch those independents and we'll establish Presbyterianism for three years in England. Well, the Scots had launched the revolution against Charles I in the first place when he tried to impose Episcopal government upon these Scottish Presbyterians. So now they thought it was their turn to use the king and his armies to force Presbyterianism upon the English. You're going to find through this period how stupid the Presbyterians were. So they thought, well, maybe we, Charles wants to use us, we can use Charles. And if he wants to establish Presbyterianism by the force of law and make people be Presbyterians, hey, that's okay with us. So King Charles persuaded many, many Scottish Presbyterians to side with him, and he began his invasion of England. May the 3rd, 1648, the Scots issued a manifesto calling upon all England to take the covenant and suppress all dissent from Presbyterianism. And the Scots also demanded the disbanding of the new model army. I would, too, if I was them. Well, not everybody in Scotland agreed with these compromisers and supporters of the king. There were still strict covenanters. There were still godly Presbyterians who didn't trust these tyrants, one of whom was a man named uh, Archibald Campbell, the Marquis of Argyle, whom we'll hear, who we'll hear more about later, who was one of the most powerful chiefs in all of Scotland. He dominated the Western Highlands. He was a Calvinist who rose at 5 o'clock every morning and prayed till 8 o'clock every morning. And uh, because of that, he had much in common with Cromwell, who also prayed often and fervently 
And so the Marquis of Argyle was against any kind of support of the king against Cromwell. But there was a powerful Scottish duke of the Hamilton clan that led a Scottish army across the border to restore Charles I as the absolute tyrant of England. When Charles marched back into England with the Scottish army, cavaliers, that is, wealthy aristocrats from all over England, began to join the battle against the new model army and against Parliament. Well, you can imagine that this Christian army, the new model army, was outraged. They tried to negotiate with the king to avoid some kind of conflict, but obviously he was just pretending in all of his negotiations. He couldn't be trusted, and he had treacherously reopened the Civil War. And so the new model army from then on out referred to Charles I as that man of blood. And they swore that they'd call Charles I to account. So the royalist army from Scotland crosses the border. When it crosses the border into England, the, we find that the hearts of most of the Scottish people were not with that army. The Scottish people, particularly the Presbyterians, the devout Presbyterians, complained loudly. They said, while everything is being done to restore the rights to King Charles Stuart, nothing is being done to restore the rights of King Christ over his church and over his nation. Cromwell defeated this Scottish army. He invaded Scotland himself and made Scott, the Scottish army surrender. When Cromwell marched his new model army into Scotland, the Scottish Presbyterians came out and gave Cromwell a magnificent reception in Edinburgh. In the meanwhile, royalists' insurrections blazed everywhere. All over England, people were standing up for the king. Riots in London, people all over crying out, God save the queen. And during that time came that famous affinity between the Stuarts and the theater, the poets and the ballad singers. Sound familiar? That here you have a tyrant and the press and art and literature and theater support the wrong people, support the king and his tyrannical efforts. Meanwhile, can you believe it? Now, I hate to tell you this. I mean, this is one of the most embarrassing. There's going to be a lot of things over the next two or three weeks. I hate to tell you. I hate to tell you that the Presbyterians in England made common cause with the Arminians against Cromwell and the new model army. Now, they've been fighting the Arminians all along, right? They believed the Arminians were bringing their innovations into the church and their new doctrine that would have the effect of supporting tyranny. And as we said, wherever Arminianism raised its ugly head in the, during those centuries, it always supported tyranny. Whether you're talking about Holland or Scotland or Ireland or England. But now the Presbyterians are willing to go to any length to support this Stuart on the throne. And so they side with the Arminians, the people that they thought were, were, were one step away from Roman Catholicism, who were the handmaidens of tyranny. They now sided with them against Cromwell and his new model army because it wasn't Scottish large, in England because it wasn't Presbyterian but largely made up of independents who nevertheless were Calvinists. So the, the royalist support began to be bigger and bigger. Well, there was only one alternative for Cromwell. I mean, what would you do? You're trying to restore peace and order and religion, morality, freedom, justice in a land. You're the parliament. You're the representatives of the people. You're constitutionally elected by the people. You have a king who inherited his throne, who has for all practical purposes declared war on his people and raised an army to invade his own land in order to extend his prerogative and his sovereignty over the church and over the state. And no matter how much you try to get him to quit, no matter how much you negotiate with him, he's going to deceive you. And he's always going to wind up trying to extend his tyranny no matter who he has to trample on, what rights, what people, what persons and property of Englishmen who supposedly were his subjects. Now, what would you do? November 7, 1648, the new model army said that Charles I had betrayed his trust and they called for his trial the first time 
in the history of the English-speaking world when a monarch was called to trial by his subjects, found guilty of treason, and executed. Cromwell was for it, of course, and has been criticized ever since. England's never forgiven Cromwell for killing one of her kings. I told you when I spent two or three weeks, Becky and I, in England last year, you could find monuments to the, every king under the sun, whether it was important or not, but you really had to search to find something about Cromwell. So I went to a library and uh, to ask for some books about historical markers or places around. I asked the librarian uh, if she knew of anything with, uh, about Cromwell, and she uh, made this face of disgust to me, and she said, well, no, because I'm not that great admirer of Cromwell. Of course, she said it in a little different accent than I'd say. <laughs> I'm not an admirer of Cromwell. And so I said, my pure Southern, well, I sure am sorry, ma'am. But so they've not, they've not forgiven. They've not forgiven Cromwell ever since. Now, let me ask you, what else were these godly men to do who loved England and freedom and Christ and the Reformed faith? Remember, we're not talking about a bunch of ambition, ambitious uh, opportunists. We're talking about the godliest army ever amassed and one of the most extraordinarily godly men that's ever lived. They loved their own country. They loved freedom. They hated tyranny. They loved Christ. They loved the Reformed faith. And in order to have all these things, that there was one thing in between them and freedom and the propagation of the Reformed faith and a free England, and that was the king. You couldn't trust the Scottish people at this point in time. You couldn't trust the king and his supporters. Parliament even was unreliable because it was filled with royalist Presbyterians who were behind the king. Now listen to this quote. Parliament, uh, I mean, uh, Cromwell and his army say that unless they interfered, Charles, popery, and tyranny would resume the superiority in England. That good men would be oppressed, they themselves beheaded, their brethren compelled to flee by thousands if they could into the wilds of America, and the Protestant would-be church crushed. One alternative offered itself to them. Must they abandon what they have done and let their things take their course? Or must they interfere irregularly in those irregular times and once more rescue England and the church? The liberties... And Protestantism of England were on the verge of shipwreck when Cromwell intervened. And all his life he upheld in Great Britain religious liberty and national prosperity. And what became of England after Cromwell's death? Lest you think his fears were exaggerated and he went too far. And he was paranoid, thinking that there was going to be tyranny and the return of Roman Catholicism and the beheading of people like him. What became of England after his death and after, after his sons and with the restoration of the Stuarts back on the throne of England? When the Stuarts returned, the rejoicings were over and the punishments followed. One hundred corpses were exhumed right after Cromwell's death, among which were the great Oliver himself, his old and venerable mother, his dearly beloved daughter Bridget Pym, and the famous Admiral Blake dug up out of their graves. Their moldering bodies were hung on the three corners of the gallow at Tyburn, and the cavaliers found a subject of merriment and pleasantry in this revolting ex exhibition. Ears were cut off, noses slit, numbers lost their heads on the scaffold. The sentence pronounced them all was conceived in the following terms. You shall be drawn on a hurdle to the place of execution, and there you shall be hanged by the neck, and being alive, you shall be cut down and mutilated. Your entrails shall be taken out of your body, and you living the same to be burnt before your eyes, and your head to be cut off, and your body to be divided into four quarters. That's what happened after, after Cromwell died and the Stuarts came back on the throne. They dug his body up, cut his head off, put it on a post where it remained for a decade. Can you imagine? As if this weren't enough, the Stuarts, after Cromwell's death, filled the country with immorality. 
2,000 ministers were driven from their offices. The churches were oppressed. The noblest hearts of the country were forced to seek a refuge in distant lands. Vast colonies in America were peopled by them. And England would have become like Spain and worse than Spain had not William III resumed the task so energetically begun by Cromwell. Had it not been for the glorious revolution when the Dutch Presbyterian William and his bride Mary came and delivered England from the Stuarts once and for all. All that happened just like Cromwell said when they put the Stuarts back on the throne. So what else were they to do but for the first time in history put the king on trial? Well, in order to put the king on trial and to have a legal court, a constitutional parliament had to be in place. And that constitutional parliament, democratically elected by the people of England, was there. But the problem is that it was dominated by Presbyterians loyal to the king. Now, how are you going to get these Presbyterian royalist parliamentarians to vote for the trial of the king. Well, you couldn't. And he saw the handwriting on the wall when many of the members of parliament said that those who even call for the trial of the king ought themselves to be arrested for high treason. So then the new model army and Cromwell realized we're not going to have the king tried. If we don't have the king tried and silenced, then we're going to have the re- reinstitution of tyranny and bloodshed and persecution. We got a parliament standing in our way. Now we got two choices, says Cromwell and the new model army who holds all the weapons. We have two choices. We can either dissolve the parliament and say, Parliament, forget it, we don't need you. In which case, we wouldn't have any constitutionally elected people to support this, and we would be accused of anarchists and revolutionaries. Or we can purge the parliament of those who would be supportive of the king. So they decided for the latter. So the new model army marched to London. In the meanwhile, Parliament just voted 125 to 58 to refuse to pay the army its back pay. That was smart, wasn't it? With the army marching to London. And Parliament also, by majority, refused the army's demand to try the King of England. So, the army arrived on December the 6th, 1647. That morning, a man by the name of Colonel Pride, one of the godly commanding officers of the new model army, stood at the door of Parliament, took names, had a list of all of the names of Parliament. I don't exactly know how he did it, but had his little checklist. And as they came into Parliament, he just asked him one question. You for any further negotiations with the king? If they said no, they were let in. If they said yes, he checked their name, and they weren't allowed in. (laughs) Ever since, that's been called Pride's Purge, where he purged the Parliament of everybody who was supportive of the king. He had to lock up some. Thirty-nine of the members of Parliament were forced to spend the night in a local tavern known as Hell. That left 80 members of the long parliament that had launched this revolution in the first place. It was pride's purge that got rid of the Presbyterian royalists. And that left a constitutionally elected parliament called the Rump Parliament. When the last of the Presbyterians were expelled from parliament, Cromwell comes back from Scotland and resumes his seat in the House of Commons. The House rejoices with his return. He's found out about pride's purge. You say, Cromwell's behind this. Sounds like something Cromwell will do. I want you to hear the testimony, the oath sworn by this extraordinary godly man when he arrives in the House of Commons and finds out what happens. He says, quote, God is my witness that I know nothing of what has been doing in this house, house. but the work is in hand. I'm glad of it, and now we must carry it through. 
In other words, here you have the sworn testimony of a godly man who said, I didn't have anything to do with it. But since it's done, I'm glad it's done. So now they had to vote. The House of Commons voted to bring King Charles to trial on charge of high treason as the cause of all the blood that had been shed in England and Scotland during the Civil War. Now, let me tell you something quickly about the makeup of this rump parliament. One of the first criticisms, once the Presbyterian royalists were kicked out, one of the first criticisms they made is that this new parliament is just a bunch of low life. That these, to use their words, are the dregs of the people, shoemakers, brewers, and other mechanic persons. That there's nobody in Parliament now who's capable of running a country. At least that's what the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, the Scottish said uh, after they got their feelings hurt for being kicked out. Well, I wish I had time to go down through the list of the people who were at the rump Parliament. They were anything but the dregs of society. There were many lords that were still there. Many of the uh, great men, powerful men, brilliant men, godly men, mayors of towns were in the rump parliament. They were anything but an irresponsible group of people, of ne'er-do-wells. So on January the 20th, 1649, Charles I was brought to the bar. 135 people were appointed by Parliament to sit as the High Court of Justice to try the sovereign. Remember, we learned two weeks ago that for the three days prior to the decision of, of, of uh, Cromwell to bring the king to trial, Cromwell and the commanding officers of the New Model Army had spent in prayer for three days and nights fasting and praying that they would know what God would have them do. And it was only after these three days of prayer that these men agreed the king had to come to trial. The trial began on Monday, January the 8th, 1648, in the exceptionally large painted chambers in the ancient Westminster Palace that was built right after the Norman Conquest in 1066. The actual proceedings of this historic trial began January the 20th. 1648. The king appeared just as you saw him in the movie. The king appeared dressed in black. He kept on his tall black hat as a mark of disrespect for the people in the courtroom, just as you saw in the Cromwell movie, the Puritans went to church with their hats on. You remember? And the reason they went to church with their hats on was to show disrespect to the Church of England for its Arminianism and its Anglo-Catholicism. Well, now Charles I stands and sits in the court, dressed in black, black hat, and the indictment is read, and the indictment is worth hearing. Its essence was that, and, and inter interspersed among these are going to be the actual, many of the actual words. Its essence was that Charles I had been trusted with limited power to govern by and according to the laws of the land and not otherwise. You see, the influence of the Protestant Reformation, uh, Protestant Reformation on their view of politics. You can see Calvin's influence and Knox's influence. They believe in a limited government, that a king is in covenant with God to rule according to the law and not go beyond the law. The child had been trusted with limited power to govern by and according to the laws of the land and not otherwise. He had, however, conceived a wicked design to erect and uphold in himself an unlimited and tyrannical power to rule according to his will and to overthrow the rights and liberties of the people. See, wherever Calvinism has taken root, tyranny has lost its head. In the pursuit of this aim, Charles had traitorous, traitorously and maliciously levied war against the present parliament and the people therein represented. He was therefore responsible for all the evils of those wars. Finally, it concluded that the said Charles Stuart be impeached as tyrant, traitor, and murderer. Those were the official charges brought against him. Tyrant, traitor, and murderer, a public and implacable enemy to the Commonwealth of England. When the court read out the indictment, particularly the words tyrant, traitor, and murderer, Charles laughed. Many years 
after Charles's death and after Cromwell's death during the restoration of the Stuarts in the 1660s, some evidence came to light that they didn't even have at Charles's trial confirming that everything they did was just that day. Because this evidence came out revealing that Charles was involved in treasonous and perfidious conspiracies against the English people, proving that he'd raised an army of 10,000 men from Ireland, which would combine with another army of 10,000 men from the Pope and from the Catholic kings of Europe, which would meet each other and march on England, trampling on English lives and liberties, restoring Charles to his tyrannical position with the agreement with the Pope that once he's back in place, Roman Catholicism would be legalized in England again. When Charles and his trial, and you didn't know about it because this is the first in history, and it was the result of the Protestant Reformation. When he was asked how he would plea, he entered no plea because he said, I do not recognize the constitutional authority of this court chosen by the rump parliament. Besides that, you remember what the precious doctrine of the Stuarts was. Rex Lex. The king is law. The king is not only above the law and cannot be tried by the law and is not accountable to the law. The king is law. The king's will is law. Might makes right. If I have the power as king to enforce it, that's what's right for the country. The same principle that modern America lives by. What moral ground does the Supreme Court have for its declaration that the murder of unborn children is legal? No moral ground. Only the might of government. The police force, the power of the courts, are the only thing behind and supportive of the Supreme Court's legalization of abortion. It has no moral principles. What did the Protestant Reformation believe? Right makes might. That if you're right, you got the power. What did Charles and the modern tyrants believe? Might makes right. If you got the power, do what you want. What did the Stuarts believe? Rex Lex. The king is law. What did the Calvinists believe? The title of the great book by Samuel Rutherford that was a bestseller in 1776 in the United States? Lex Rex. The law is king. So he refused to, to, uh, to recognize the authority of the, of the court in which he was tried. He accused the court in trying the king of breaking English common law. Said that it's never, been, it's never happened before. On the other hand, he was told by the chairman of the court that any prisoner who refused to plead would be treated in accordance with English common law as if he were guilty and justice would proceed on that basis. Now, I want, you to I want to read to you now something verbatim that the king said in the court. The king, in a deadly statement, said in part, quote, If power without law may make laws, may alter the fundamental laws of the kingdom, I do not know what subject he is in England that can be sure of his life or anything that he calls his own. What a cocky rascal. He says, you're, just, you're, you're basing your trial of me if power makes right. You've got the power of the new model, model army. If you didn't have the army, you couldn't do this. And here Charles I is saying, anybody knows that it's immoral to build a nation upon power. <laughs> this was an incredibly arrogant statement from a man who had illegally taxed his citizenry who had men imprisoned, mutilated, tortured, and killed because they dared to differ with him and who trampled on the common law of England for decades. Of course, he was right. There was no English legal precedent for his trial, but not because he was not guilty of the crimes for which he was indicted. 
What was lacking in this whole situation was a John Knox. If John Knox was there, he could illustrate from the foundations of Christianity, from the Word of God, particularly the Old Testament, on precedence for doing away with tyrannical kings. Finally, on January the 27th, 1648, at 10 o'clock in the morning, the King of England was brought to hear his sentence. Charles demanded to speak. It was too late. John Bradshaw, the chairman of the court, made his summation that the king was subject to law. And what a great Christian political statement this is by the chairman of the court. This was not in the movie. In answer, and he's looking right at the king. In answer to charges that the trial was unprecedented, Bradshaw called on the oldest traditions of Christendom. See if this reminds you of anything. There is a contract and a bargain made, he said, between the king and his people, and your oath is taken. And certainly, sir, the bond is reciprocal. For as you are the Lord, they are your liege subjects. The bond or protection is due from the sovereign. The other is the bond of subjection that is due from the subject. Sir, if this bond ever be broken, farewell sovereignty. Shades of John Knox, who said that government is covenantal. That government is based on a series of covenants. A covenant a king makes to God that he will submit to God's supremacy over him. A covenant the king makes to the people that he will protect them according to the law of God not go beyond it. A covenant the people make to the king that they will be subject to him as long as he obeys the law of God. And a covenant with God that they will be his faithful people. And when the king breaks his covenant, farewell, sovereignty. I only pray that we had to have a covenantal view of politics today. We have a king. We have a president who has broken covenant with God and with the citizens of this land. And is exerting his tyrannical, ungodly, evil rule along with an evil Congress. We ought to be able to say, if this bond is ever broken. Farewell, sovereignty. Instead of, but you watch, that ain't going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised if Clinton will not be the next president of the United States. Instead of protecting his subjects, Charles I had made war on his own subject and he deserved to die as a tyrant, a traitor, and a murderer. So on the morning of Tuesday, January the 30th, 1648, Charles Stuart, King of England, put on two shirts that cool morning so that he wouldn't shiver from the cold on his way to the gallows and so he wouldn't give the impression by shaking that he was fearful as he walked to his execution. That really happened. He didn't arrive at the appointed place until 2 o'clock p.m. Everything was prepared, and here's an eyewitness. Quote, The watchers held their breaths. The king stretched out his hands. The executioner swung his axe. The head fell off. A 17-year-old boy among the spectators said later, The people let out such a groan as I never heard before. And desire I may never hear again. And the world has never been the same since the execution of Charles I. The English monarchy has never been the same since Oliver Cromwell. Now, Parliament, and the, particularly the model army, was supreme. But armies cost money. You got to have a lot of money to have a great army. So there had to be money to pay the army for its back pay that it had never received. It had to have money for another 12,000 soldiers to march into Ireland. And so what did the rump parliament do? The rump parliament proposed 
a method of getting this money. It proposed to punish the loyal supporters of the king and the recent civil war that led to so much death and bloodshed by confiscating all of the property of those who had fought for King Charles. Mm -hmm. Now, that included the property of many cavaliers. So we're talking about a good source of money for this new model army. Many of the sons, now listen, many of the sons of these families who fought for King Charles against Cromwell realized that they were facing poverty under this new law of confiscation. So the sons of these royalists chose to immigrate to America, where they founded new families. And the names of the families founded in America by the sons of those who fought for Charles against Cromwell were such names as Washington, Lee, Randolph, Madison, and others. These were Episcopalians, don't forget. And their forefathers came to America to escape Cromwell. But they learned their lesson. By the time of George and James and Light Horse Harry and the rest, they learned you couldn't trust an English monarch and an English parliament. And so their, though their fathers came to escape Cromwell, their grandsons fought against King George and the English Parliament. We'll start next week with the war against Ireland. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for Oliver Cromwell, for his testimony, for his efforts to advance your kingdom, live by your word. We pray that you'd help us to be faithful to the message that you're going to use to overturn the wisdom of this world. We pray that you'd help us to understand your strategy, that not many mighty or noble, but the low and the base you'll use, and help us to understand that it is by the preaching of the Word of God. Bless these things, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.